Hey everyone, it's me, Oski from VeggieCoin, and I really wanted to put together a video explaining in super great detail exactly what the Bitcoin original white paper means, written by Satoshi Nakamoto. Now there really isn't a very good video out there that really goes into the depth that I think would be interesting on the Bitcoin white paper. So I thought I'd go through the entire thing from start to finish and really pull it apart sentence by sentence um, so that you the audience can get a full understanding of exactly what this white paper is trying to say and just what satoshi nakamoto intended bitcoin to be in the early days so here's the abstract a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution so there's two key points here Okay, the first thing is the part about the financial institution. So that could mean a bank or something like that. Some authority, two parties trust to validate a transaction. Okay, but the abstract is saying it's going to be a peer-to-peer -peer version which doesn't need a financial institution. So that brings me to the second point, peer-to-peer. -peer. What does that mean? Well, that means directly between the two parties that are transacting. So with traditional banking, it's not peer-to-peer. -peer. You have to tell the bank that you want to give somebody money or something like that, and then the bank will validate that transaction based on whether it knows that your credentials are correct and the person that you want to send money to has those details as well. But in Bitcoin, it's peer-to-peer -peer without a financial institution. Digital signatures provide part of the solution but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. So a little bit of brief history here. Bitcoin wasn't the first digital asset that wanted to represent a currency and be used as an alternative to fiat currency. There has been electronic cash that predates Bitcoin. And the main issue that was arising with this kind of digital cash was something called the double spending problem. What the double spending problem is, is you're someone I'm buying an item from um, and I spend the money buying that item to you. But then I quickly go off and I spend that money again before the first transaction is validated. Therefore, I'm able to spend the cash twice and then when the second transaction is validated it nullifies the first one after you've provided me with the service or product that you're offering you think I've paid you but before the network can um, fully validate that transaction I've already spent that uh, money again and that invalidates the first time that I've spent the money so the Bitcoin white paper um, in its purest form solves this double spending problem we propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. There's that peer-to-peer -peer again. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof-of-work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof-of-work. So this section is saying that they're going to try and solve the double spending problem by introducing the idea of proof-of-work. You have to do a certain amount of work to tell the network and to make the network uh, aware that a transaction has been made and to um, undo this chain of transactions would require too much work for it to be practical. The longest chain not only serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. As long as the majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. So as long as at least 51% of the network is being honest, um, then it's immune to attack and corruption. The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on a best effort basis, and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof of work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. So as long as 51% of the network is being honest, and there's no reliance on a central authority to validate the network, nodes can come and leave, and they're not um, having to validate the network at all times. So just to summarize this abstract, Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer network that doesn't require a authoritative figure or third party to validate transactions. And it also solves the double spending problem that other peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash systems were experiencing at that time. Okay, so here's the introduction. Commerce on the internet has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. While the system works well enough for most transactions, it still suffers from the inherent weaknesses of the trust 
trust-based model. So what does it mean by the trust-based model? Well, what the trust-based model is, is two parties trusting an authoritative figure like a bank or some kind of financial institution to do the right thing with the funds that they supply to make some kind of financial transaction. So if you're uh, using your credit card to buy new shoes on eBay, your bank, whoever supplied you with that credit card, is the trusted third party in the trust-based model. So why is that a problem? Why wouldn't you want to use the trust-based model? Well, for example, in some economies or in some countries, the governments aren't that stable and you could get persecuted and your account could be frozen, um, for example, for breaking the law and you could be at a disadvantage with using the trust-based model in a sort of area like that. But what Bitcoin wants to do, or what Bitcoin wanted to do, is have a financial system or a financial instrument that doesn't rely on a third party to authenticate or uh, validate those transactions. So therefore there's no way for a government or a malicious uh, powerful body to uh, swoop in and freeze your funds or steal your funds. It's completely trustless and the power is completely spread out between all of the users of the network. So it's really a good way to um, secure your funds against a powerful third body like uh, government or something like that who could potentially uh, freeze your funds because they are the trusted authoritative figure that acted maliciously. And that leads very nicely into the next section. Completely non-reversible transactions are not really possible since financial institutions cannot avoid mediating disputes. The cost of mediation increases transaction costs, limiting the minimum practical transaction size and cutting off the possibility for small casual transactions. And there is a broader cost in the loss of ability to not make non-reversible payments for non-reversible services. So that means there's absolutely no way in the trust-based model to be sure that when you make a transaction, that transaction is completely irreversible. A bank could choose to reverse a transaction if they wanted to or if they were forced to by a government. But with Bitcoin, since it's a decentralized system where no single uh, body or person has control over the network, there's no way for a bully or a, a malicious body in power to reverse a transaction to basically gain an advantage or um, act maliciously. So that's a huge advantage over the trust-based model. Once you've paid for something, that's it. It's in the network, it's on the blockchain, and you can't um, reverse that unless you have 51% or more of the total power of the network. Now, a speculation in this white paper that didn't really uh, end up kind of working out that way was the promise of small casual transactions, the possibility of small casual transactions. Um, we've actually seen with the adoption of Bitcoin that, uh, especially around the Christmas time of 2017, um, the transaction cost of Bitcoin got absolutely so high that no, it wouldn't actually have been appropriate for small transactions at all. And really it was only appropriate for those kind of large scale transactions transactions. So not, not things like cups of coffee and, and Mars bars. Um, Bitcoin transactions could cost in the order of $50 just to make one transaction. So um, that speculation didn't really come true. It was definitely true in the early days, but um, certainly not uh, when, when the network gets congested with a lot of um, transactions. With the possibility of reversal, the need for trust spreads. Merchants must be wary of their customers, hassling them for more information than they would otherwise need. A certain percentage of fraud is accepted as unavoidable. These costs and payment uncertainties can be avoided in person by using physical currency, but no mechanism exists to make payments over a communications channel without a trusted party. Bitcoin is setting out to mitigate the unavoidable level of fraud that is prevalent in the trust-based model um, by using cryptographic techniques that are allowing um, a trustless payment system between two parties over a, communica over a communication channel. What is needed is an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust allowing any two willing parties to transact directly with each other without the need for a trusted third party. So what Bitcoin is saying here, and what, what Satoshi is saying here, is that instead of having a third party that's going to validate these transactions and going to act as a body of trust and authority between these two parties, we can use cryptography, cryptographic techniques, to generate a proof 
of this transaction rather than needing to trust somebody to verify it for you. You can use cryptography, cryptographic techniques to generate a proof rather than needing this trust. Transactions that are computationally impractical to reverse would protect sellers from fraud and routine escrow mechanisms could easily be implemented to protect buyers. In this paper, we propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer distributed timestamp server to generate computational proof of the chronological order of transactions. The system is secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any cooperating group of attacker nodes. So the first point here that you need to understand is that the transactions are going to be computationally impractical to reverse. Okay, so it's going to be easy enough to make a transaction, but to take that transaction and reverse it is going to be computationally impractical. What does that mean? Well, that really means that it's going to take a, a crazy amount of computational power to reverse um, one of these transactions. And actually, to do it successfully, you're going to need at least 51% of the uh, computing power on the network to even have a chance to reverse these transactions. Another key point here is that this proof of work proposed in this paper is also going to be used to solve the double spending problem that has been occurring in previous electronic cash systems. And the double spending problem solved in this white paper will work um, as long as the nodes that are acting honestly on the network have at least 51% of the power. So then the paper goes on to discuss exactly how the transactions would work to achieve this. Okay, so here's the next section. We define an electronic coin as a chain of digital signatures. Each owner transfers the coin to the next by digitally signing a hash of the previous transaction and the public key of the next owner and adding these to the end of the coin. A payee can verify the signatures to verify the chain of ownership. So they've provided a little bit of a diagram here to make the transaction seem a little bit more clear. And you can see that you have this kind of chain effect of these transactions where each new transaction is validating the one before it and making it more secure in this, in this chain of transactions, okay? So that is what the hash um, here is, all right? So this hash is the hash of the previous transaction. All this information inside the transaction is hashed and gives us a hash for the next transaction, okay? And that gives us the signature of the last transaction, which can be verified by the public key of the owner of that transaction, as well as the private key, which provides the signature um, of, of the transaction. So you can verify this transaction without actually having to see the private key um, of the owner of those coins. They've provided a signature using the private key, and you see that to verify the transaction. So you never have to show private keys to each other, just public keys and this signature. Now it goes on to talk about the double spending problem and how this doesn't actually uh, solve the double spending problem yet, but we will definitely come to that. So the problem, of course, is the payee can't verify that one of the owners did not double spend the coin. A common solution is to introduce a trusted central authority, or mint, that checks every transaction for double spending. After each transaction, the coin must be returned to the mint to issue a new coin, and only coins issued directly from the mint are trusted not to be double spent. The problem with this solution is that the fate of the entire money system depends on the company running the mint, with every transaction having to go through them, just like a bank. So what this is saying here is that if you introduce this mint or this bank, then you're really defeating the whole purpose of having a decentralized trustless network. It's no longer trustless anymore. Um, you have to trust this mint or bank um, to solve the double spending problem. So that completely defeats the whole purpose of having um, all of this new wonderful cryptographic technology. We need a way for the payee to know that the previous owners did not sign any earlier transactions. For our purposes, the earliest transaction is the one that counts, so we don't care about later attempts to double spend. The only way to confirm the absence of a transaction is to be aware of all transactions. In the Mint-based model, the Mint was aware of all transactions and decided which arrived first. To accomplish this without a trusted party, transactions must be publicly announced, and we need a system for participants to agree on a single history of the order in which they were received. 
the payee needs proof that at the time of each transaction, the majority of nodes agreed it was the first received. So what this is saying is, is that if the majority at least of the network all agree on the complete list of all transactions throughout the history of the network, then there's no way to possibly double spend coins because everybody, or at least the majority of nodes on the network, know where all of the coins have been spent through their entire lives. So this introduce, introduces the idea of a public ledger that everybody on the network has access to and everybody can see the balances of all the different wallets on the network. So this is the next section, timestamp server. The solution we propose begins with a timestamp server. A timestamp server works by taking a hash of a block of items to be timestamped and widely publishing the hash, such as in a newspaper or Usenet post. The timestamp proves that the data must have existed at the time, obviously, in order to get into the hash. Each timestamp includes the previous timestamp in its hash, forming a chain with each additional timestamp reinforcing the ones before it. So this is saying that everybody on the entire network knows the timestamps of all the transactions. So you can't just pretend that you made a transaction at a time that you didn't. When you make a transaction, the timestamp is going to be there embedded into the system, embedded into the blockchain, and everybody is going to be able to see that timestamp and agree on that timestamp with this idea of consensus. So at the end, it says each timestamp includes the previous timestamp in its hash, forming a chain with each additional timestamp reinforcing the ones before it. So you're not able to inject information into the blockchain in the middle somewhere without affecting the whole rest of the chain and invalidating the whole rest of the chain. Um, so this is why each block is hashed into the next block so that you get this chain effect. And if one part of the chain is broken, then it invalidates every single block after that. And if that blockchain gets invalidated, it's no longer the longest chain. So the rest of the network is going to go, hey, I have a longer chain that's more, that's been validated for longer. Therefore, I trust this longer chain to be correct. So this has been the first section of what's probably going to end up being a four or five part video series on dissecting the Bitcoin original white paper. I hope you found it educational and enjoyable to listen to. And make sure you check out the preceding videos in the future when I upload them. Thank you.